well, why are these same kids that are coming to Coke Club struggling in their traditional environments? I got to know a lot of them. I got to know their families. Some of these kids were getting suspended for behavior problems or getting bad grades or, um, you know, many of them had this conception of themselves as dumb or broken or not, you know, not a good student. And I'm looking at them code and I'm thinking, there's no problem with your brain. You know, you're, you're totally capable. It's just uh, for other reasons. Um, it's not, it's not clicking for you. And so at that point, um, I started to ask the question like, well, what would this look like if it wasn't just coding and it wasn't just after school? Like, what if this was a, <laughs> what if this was school, right? And, and we applied these same principles. Welcome to episode 41 of People Are The Answer. I truly believe that people are the only answer to the world's many problems. I'm Jeffrey M. Zucker, a serial entrepreneur, here to learn how innovators are creating outsized transformational social impact. Today's episode features Kelly Smith, founder of Prenda, a platform that helps passionate people start and run micro schools. Kelly's goal is to change the way we think about education. Kelly and I discuss his background in nuclear fusion, his time in the energy sector, teaching kids how to code, founding Prenda, the issues with our current education system, and more. Here's Kelly Smith on People Are The Answer. Kelly, thank you for joining me on People Are The Answer. Thanks, Jeffrey. I'm excited to be here. Excited to have you, and it'd be great if you could start off by telling our audience who you are, where you're based, and what your current role is. So my name is Kelly Smith. I live in Mesa, Arizona. It's a suburb of Phoenix. Um, this is kind of my hometown. I spent a lot of time in other places, but moved back here not that long ago. And my role um, is founder and CEO of Prenda, which is a company that helps people do micro schools. Awesome. Well, I look forward to digging into Prenda with you. And in general, though, what would you say motivates you? What motivates me is learning, I think. I just... Um, I really enjoy the process of gaining new knowledge and skills, uh, whether that's a new musical instrument or changing the brakes on my car or a new school of you know, obscure philosophy. Um, I just, I like it. I like learning. That's awesome. That's It's a great attribute to have because there's just a never ending pool of knowledge out there to learn from. Yeah. I, I don't understand. Um, sometimes I have these discussions with my kids. I'm a father of four. And, uh, and I'm not maybe super patient with the, uh, I know enough already, uh, mentality It's just the longer I go, the, the longer the list gets of things that I feel on a, you know, and this urgency that keeps building and increasing around, I just want it all, you know, I want to be able to write a novel and I want to learn the violin. And I just, I'm not spending time on any of these things, uh, even started either of those, for example, I want to travel everywhere and see, like meet people from all different uh, walks of life. And, and sometimes it's like, you know, anytime it's just like, oh, I have enough. I don't know. What what do I need to learn for? It's like, I don't No, I, I have that as well, though. Like there's languages I haven't learned yet that I want to learn instruments, you know, and it's just like, well, I don't know if I'll ever get the time. I've obviously got a lot going on in my daily life, but hopefully I'll find some time. Right. Well, learn, uh, starting a podcast is a great way to do it. So kudos to you. I mean, this is not only do you learn the techniques of audiovisual and producing and marketing it and everything else, but you get to talk to people, which is a great way to learn. And I listen all the time to podcasts. So hopefully this is a useful conversation for, for your listeners. I'm, I'm sure it will be. And, and thank you for that. It's, it's been a lot of fun getting to talk to people that are doing really cool work. And um, uh, did you mention that you grew up in Arizona? Mm -hmm. What was it like growing up? Hot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, I think it was a pretty standard, like middle America upbringing. I went to public schools in the suburbs. Um, my parents, you know, bought a tracked three bedroom house in 1985. And, you know, it was a relatively new suburb that has kind of gone through the, you know, the, the change of time over, over the years. Um, I think, I was maybe slightly more curious about the world or ambitious. I maybe had a something to prove or some sense of getting out and doing my thing. So by the time I graduated high school, I was just like, if I see another cactus, I'm going to like lose my mind. And I want to be around <laughs> people that are, you know, like challenging my ideas and expanding. And 
Um, and so I left, I, I went to school. Um, I did a mission for my church. So that was two years that I spent in Portugal. I did grad school, ended up at MIT for that, studying nuclear fusion and, um, and started to meet all these people and ha have these experiences um, really with the sense of like, let's take on the world and, and see what happens. And, um, and it was a great, I mean, great journey. I think I was away for 15 years. Um, uh, my wife and I got married early in that journey. And so we, we really got to do it together, uh, four kids and five States later. Um, you know, we, we still are just so grateful for the life we have and, um, and, you know, you've picked up your friends and, and experiences and learnings uh, in all of those places. So when the opportunity presented itself in 2013, which is now almost 10 years ago, to come back home and be close to family, um, you know, it was it was interesting. We, I, I thought that that moment would be like, uh, you know, tail between my legs, just sort of coming back defeated. And it wasn't like that at all. It was a deliberate choice to be in a place that's personally meaning for, meaningful for me. I feel connected to the community and, uh, and it's been a great platform to stand on as I've tried to take some entrepreneurial risk and do some other things um, that are, you know, potentially uh, just, just as challenging, if not more so than, than some of the other. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. It sounds like you had a really interesting journey in your time away from Arizona. What was it like spending two years in Portugal? It's just spectacular. I don't know if you've met Portuguese people, but um, Heather, some of my favorite. It's it's such a great culture. Um, I made lifelong friends. I got connected with, you know, the experience of being a stranger in a strange land and to be then accepted or taken in. Um, I remember one of our early days I was there. I think I I arrived in December, so it was getting close to Christmas season and um, you know, you're far from home. It's my first time being away from my family for holidays that uh, I was used to being around. And so, um, you know, you feel this loneliness and this isolation. And there's, we knocked on the door of, of a family to talk to and um, they didn't really know us. They were clearly preparing for like a family session that, that like they had the dinner all, the table was set and things like the festivities were about to begin. And there was this older couple and they, they decided to like invite me into their house and sit and visit. Um, and it's a, it's a gratitude and a kindness that like, I'll always remember it's, it's a way that I want to be is, is bringing people in like literally in that, uh, in that way, it was just a really powerful, powerful thing. So that's just one moment. I mean, sitting with the, the old men talking about soccer and weather and some of the things that they would talk about uh, meeting the younger generation, there was a, just a really driven, hardworking group of people in the Lisbon area that, you know, it's like Beautiful. building the future of their country and those people are inspiring and, and it just all of it, you know, the teenagers always were messing with us. It was great. We spent time in government housing and just, I get to meet people from all over the country. Awesome. That, that sounds super interesting. Like it was an impactful experience and uh, that was before you went to MIT. Yeah. So that was kind of took a break. And so, so then you studied nuclear fusion at MIT. That sound, sounds daunting to me. Yeah. I mean, I, I think again, it was just like, I want to learn. Right. And um, these problems seemed interesting. Uh, I picked physics as an undergrad. Um, you know, you're looking for a major. It's like, well, I love humanities. I love history. I love economics. I love computer science. I love statistics. There was all these things. And it's like, what do I major in? Um, but what I found really got me going was it's that kind of third why the third to fifth time you ask why, right? You just go deeper and deeper and deeper. And so being like recognizing in me that type of, of attribute of like, I want to understand the fundamentals. Like, why does this work? How does it work? Um, physics was the perfect place for this, right? Cause you know, you get down to these like fundamental forces and laws of nature. And, um, and so I love that. I mean, I loved my modern physics, quantum mechanics classes. I loved I worked in a lab doing high energy laser physics as an undergrad. And so when it was time to choose, you know, do I go for more school? Um, it was, it was a pretty easy choice actually. Like, yeah, I want to be doing experimental physics. Um, the researcher that I ended up working with at MIT was in need of a graduate student to build a laser system. They literally gave me like a million dollars of budget to like order the wow. parts and, and sort of, ship, you know, get it all shipped to me and then build it out and put the, um, 
see, there's my dog. <laughs> uh, and, and to, no, I know that. Game. Um, to build the laser system. And, and that's something that, you know, like it's once in a lifetime, you don't get opportunities like that. Many people don't. And um, it was all interesting. I mean, I felt like a big dummy at MIT. It was, um, it was full of people way smarter than me. And so, you know, you're failing tests and you're struggling through concepts, but those are the right kind of people to surround yourself with. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a lot of fun. And then it, as it turns out, we all felt that way. So right. I right, take, take that for what it's worth. So it sounds like you enjoyed your time there. I loved it. Yeah. And met just, again, it's like you're collecting like experience and friendships, um, many of which have lasted, you know, the whole time since. So it's been great. I saw um, that after your time at N MIT, you spent a short time as a tutor. And I know you have, you know, obviously eventually ended up in education. Was that is sort of your first time teaching. Did you see that? Was that on my LinkedIn? Did I put that on there? It's on your LinkedIn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I can't stop tutoring. So this was actually a source of some tension between my wife and I, because finally, after years and years of school, I had profitable, gainful employment, right? Like I had a job. We were in the Bay Area. Uh, I was working as a energy consultant, energy engineer for a consulting firm. We did cool projects for you know, the, the big electric utilities. And it was all about like, how can you save energy and operate more efficiently and reduce carbon footprint? Those were cool, like really interesting things, but I couldn't let it go. Right. And then, so I had done tutoring actually all the way through, um, through my like schools. I just find this challenge, you know, if, if I love learning, it's like, I love almost as much or maybe even more like the experience of helping another person learn. And, and really getting them to the place where they not only like answer the question correctly, which to me, that's like 10% of it. It's like getting them to a place where they actually care, right? They, they're trying to process what's going on. And physics tutoring was great for that. I did a lot of math tutoring. So um, yeah, when I got this job, I was happy at work. I really was, but I just couldn't let it go. And I, I found this little local organization that Tutors, kids, uh, this was, you know, I did a couple nice, really nice families in the kind of wealthy suburbs of, of San Francisco and the East Bay. And I would drive up, you know, these hills and go to their beautiful houses and meet their teenagers and, and help them um, grapple with the concepts of math. And for me, it was always this game of not just can they understand math? It's like, can they love it? Can I get them to love it, to yeah. love it and appreciate math? So that was what I... Uh, yeah, I just loved it. And finally, my wife's like, hey, you have a job and a family. Like, it's probably time to let this go. But that, well, that's a really good perspective, though, on teaching and like getting them to love it. And, um, you know, we'll dig into Prenda in a little bit. But just the idea of like individualized learning to help someone love something like that is, is so interesting. And um, did you have any inkling at that time that education was going to be a big part of your future? I made this list, Jeffrey, that was like, what jobs could I see myself doing? Um, and especially towards the end of MIT, because I had initially thought I'd do a PhD. I, I left with a master's degree. And um, during that, you know, transition, I'm thinking, okay, well, if I'm not a science researcher, what am I, you know? And, I, and that's a, you know, those are scary questions. You have to sort of understand yourself and, and go through all that, the insecurities. Anyway, I made this list and on the list, every time I'd make lists like this, it was like, high school physics teacher, right? Like I could totally see myself um, doing that or being a high school physics teacher. But then I thought about my high school physics teachers and they're great people, but they definitely exuded a sense of being trapped, you know, like a prisoner in some sort of jail. Like they, they weren't happy. They weren't loving their life. They were counting down their days to retirement. Um, I think they maybe at one point in their career felt like they could make an impact or make a difference, but that sense or that energy wasn't wasn't there, didn't feel the way that, um, that I felt. And then of course, being shallow and superficial, I'm, I'm looking at my growing family. I think we had one child already while I was a grad student. So, um, I'm thinking, can I, you know, provide the livelihood, like what are teacher salaries? And so the combination of that, I never really took it seriously to go, uh, enter the kind of traditional education jobs, even though I've gravitated always towards educator friends. In fact, Several of my friends back in those days, while I was a science researcher, um, they were um, 
at Harvard doing education research, you know, and, and those were the people that I wanted to hang out with. Just ask them the hard questions about, you know, what, what works, what doesn't work, where's, what does the research say? Um, so that stuff's always been interesting to me. Got it. It's very interesting to hear. And, um, you know, you looks like you went on to spend about a decade in various positions in the energy sector. Yeah. You want to talk about it? So, well, <laughs> yeah. I would love to hear about, about some of your roles and kind of what it was like working in that sector. So this starts with a presentation at MIT while I was a student. It was actually a lot of presentations because we were in the, the plasma science and fusion center. Um, so this was the group at MIT that does, that tries to make fusion work and you'd get these presentations and it's like, here's all the problems. We've got, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and global warming as a result. We've got, um, all of these, um, you know, geopolitical tensions around availability of fossil fuels. You've got socks and knocks and local air pollution, air pollution issues. And so people are like talking about all the Oh, you got nuclear proliferation. Like what happens if bad people get uranium, all these things. And it's like, um, that the last slide of every presentation was like, therefore we need fusion, right? Like free energy from seawater that will like power the whole planet in the future. And I still, just to be clear, like I believe in fusion as, as a great piece of the future. I think it's going to be amazing. But the joke was like, it's always 20 years away or 50 years away. And literally that was almost 20 years ago. And it still is, you know, it's like, it, it just continues to be elusive, right? These are hard problems. So instead of fusion's my answer to all these problems, I thought maybe we just use the energy we have better. And that was really what, what launched that, that career. I got to meet some folks that were involved in the energy efficiency business. Right. I Looking at energy efficiency, I was really intrigued, right? Like this is an opportunity to um, make an, a real impact on these big societal questions there's a lot of technological complexity. There's also economics and human decision-making in all of this. That's super fascinating. And so, um, yeah, I really liked that career. I did consulting for one job. I did a kind of a lot of engineering projects, which then tipped over into some like market research type projects. And then I had a job with a, a big company in Milwaukee. We moved to, to the Midwest and working in, um, at, at a big corporation there, I was one of the small team that was really focused on, you know, how do you help large commercial buildings use their energy better, save money, reduce their carbon footprint, things like that. And it was fascinating. Yeah, I got to do, um, I got to do all kinds of work. I got to meet all kinds of people, really understand business, really uh, dabble with product design. So I did some of that. Uh, I worked a lot with the marketing and communications people and learned from all of them. And then I got to this point where listening to customers, um, I had this idea that if you just give uh, commercial building owners their energy data and some some tips of how to improve it, um, they would find that valuable and it creates a good opportunity. And so I kind of pitched that internally with the company I was working for. The company decided that wasn't a priority, but me and a friend, um, you know, built it, right? We just created our own startup and, and that was, uh, eventually we, we won a little contest with the, under the Obama white house, the apps for innovation project. And we got a little bit of press and then we sold that business pre-revenue. It was very small to a company that was uh, venture backed and had a great opportunity working, um, remotely for this company from Boston that, uh, provides energy data and analytics to uh, building owners. And so that was, that was my role. And I was kind of a pro mostly on product. I joke that I, I can code a little bit and I can sell a little bit, but I'm not very good at either of those things. <laughs> and so if you just put those together, like that's roughly where I sit is I'll, I'll find a solution, build just a hacked together version of it, just enough to give people the idea. And then, um, and then I hand it over to people that, that are better than me. Well, I'm sure you learned a lot in that experience and it's cool to hear that you were a successful entrepreneur, um, you know, relatively early in your career. Yeah, it was a, it was a great experience. I don't know if that I would count that as successful entrepreneur. I think maybe doing it at all, like puts you in a category because I spent years thinking about it before doing anything. Um, so successful in that sense, but this wasn't like a huge exit or something. It was just 
an opportunity to, to be involved. Sounds successful regardless. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. I definitely learned a lot. During your time in the energy sector, you also started Code Clubs of Arizona. Um, and that looks like another turn back toward education. Can you tell me you know, what led you to start that and what it is or was, whichever? <laughs> yeah, so it, I didn't think of it in terms of education at the time. Um, this was shortly after that acquisition and, and we moved back home. So this was now I'm in Mesa, Arizona. I've got four kids. My oldest is eight. And I had always told my kids, you should learn chess and computer programming. Like these are two things that every kid should know, right? It's just a great way to work your brain muscles. It doesn't, I don't care if you like go into them professionally, but it's just a good thing for, for young people. And it's a creative outlet, a creative medium um, that kids can have a lot of fun with. Frankly, it's like, you, you, you know, used to be able to, me and my friend would make up board games, right? Out of cardboard and paper, or we recorded our own little like rap album when I was 10, you know, like with a tape recorder, like the tape recorder and the paper, those are materials on which human creativity can happen. Well, now it's like you can use for loops and variables and like no code sort of visual graphical clicking things together to make like actual interactive games and apps and websites and um, and you learn a ton in the process. So with all that in my head, it was like, instead of doing this at home, this is maybe the, 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 the slight piece of inspiration or craziness, however you want to look at it, was like, we could do this at home, sure, but instead let's invite the neighborhood. <laughs> and so I talked to the librarian into letting me use the, the um, computer lab there. And this was, you know, August of 2013. So nine years ago, um, we, I put posters up around that, that neighborhood. It's kind of like a low income neighborhood in the center of, of my city and kids started wandering in. We got kids coming in off the street. I did my background check, you know, and I was the volunteer facilitator for this code club, uh, which then opened my eyes to this whole new realm of, of edu really a lot of these ideas that I'd had about education, but I started to think structurally about it. And, and that was a fascinating journey from there. And Code Club of Arizona is still around, right? We uh, started as just a, a bunch of, uh, a couple hacker friends. I got to shout out Andy Jennings, one of my high school friends that his kids started coming to Code Club and we went and got tacos and Andy thankfully was willing to um, to help me with it. He's way better at coding than I am, has you know, a PhD in math and just a really sharp brain. Um, it went from that group of sort of, I don't know, like dads, I guess you could say, just sort of tinkering to a nonprofit. The Code Clubs of Arizona was this uh, design basically that said, hey, we're doing this here. We could help other people do it too. And so we provided resources. At first, it was just like a packet of information, like this is how to do it. And then that turned into some software. Um, and then that actually turned into a business. So we we did sell kind of a software, like learning management system, like a curriculum and and some training for libraries under the premise that you don't actually don't need to know how to code to teach coding. And this is, <laughs> it's kind of unconventional to think that way uh, because we picture this world where you have a teacher standing up explaining something. Um, but if you can drop that, and we've met a lot of people who have, have done that. Librarians, by the way, are great at that because they say, I don't know the answer, but I know how to help you find it. Well, that's exactly the right mantra, right? If you're to right. encourage self-learners. And so putting this together, you know, working through libraries, we got some grant funding. We did work all over the U United States, a lot in like small communities. Um, and yeah, we, we built up a, a small business uh, doing code clubs. Luke Miller, who was the first person that I hired back in like 2017 or 16, I think it was 2016. Um, Luke is still running that. We've spun it off. He's, he now is the owner of Fiero Learning and, and they, do, um, they do code clubs for libraries and that continues to be uh, a great little business. So awesome. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's kind of a fun piece of the story and it's been just such a treasure. Yeah. It's a nice legacy. That it's still going and growing. That's that's. I mean, I agree with you. I think coding is really important to learn. I I you know, despite being a little bit older than a lot, than a lot of these people that are going through it now, I got to learn some coding in in high school and taught myself some in college. And 
um, certainly just helps the way you think in a lot of ways. It's awesome. I always like asking kids, like, what's the, what's the thing you've made that you're the proudest of? Do you have an answer for that with your coach? Do I? I mean, you know, in high school, I was an AP computer and my, our teacher used to lament that he didn't like the AP system because it locked him into what he had to teach us. He wanted to teach us how to learn languages, coding languages, instead of he had to teach us Java for right. the test. And so, you know, we built uh, Monopoly that year among a couple other things. That's cool. And then I, you know, I sort of taught myself HTML and um, I started a, a club hockey team at my high school and I like built our website from scratch in HTML, which was a lot of fun. And um, and then in college, I did some, uh, a few different languages that I tried out, but uh, you know, the hockey team website in, in high school, that was, I was proud of it at the time. It's great. Yeah. That's all that matters. You don't have to be proud of it now. It's just, uh... yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's very cool. I, I think that's what's so fun. And, and that's what I always want to know is like, is it, connecting for you, right? Like one of the visits, I became friends with the administration of one of the high-end like private schools um, where people would pay a lot of money to send their kids. And all these kids would say, yeah, I'm gonna do computer science. Like I'm interested in this. They had an AP computer, computer science class that um, I would ask these students, you know, tell me something, show me something that you're proud of or something that you're excited about. And they would look at me like, what do you mean? like?" I just have assignments. Yeah, we didn't get to be creative in the AP. But it was never the sense of like, I chose this, I want to do this. And that was a sort of reinforcement for me of how maybe there are ways we are inadvertently um, hurting learning, right? We're, we're yeah. putting, we're setting humans up for something other than, you know, if it's if it's comply with the rules or conform with the crowd, like those are things that they, they can be good for their own reasons, but... Um, but they can also work at odds with, with like this exciting endeavor of human learning. Yeah. I mean, my, in my own learning, I always did a lot better in the, the classes and the projects that I was really excited about and passionate about. And, you know, that seems to ring true with, with most people. And um, so even, and I think that, you know, we've tried to, and I'm curious to hear your philosophy on it. You're the expert, but we've tried to put this sort of blanket over education and how things are taught for so long in our society. And the reality is that individualized learning is so much more powerful. Yeah. I'm writing a book about this. So there's probably too much that I, I won't try to dump it all on you right now, but <laughs> two people that I think really understood this one was a thousand, you know, plus years ago named Plutarch. And he was an ancient Roman philosopher that said, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. And if you think hard about those symbols, right, you've got pouring water into a cup, like that's kind of how we're set up, right? We think, okay, I've got my academic standards. I've got test prep. I've got to get my results. So I'm going to push kids through carrots and sticks to remember this information long enough to be able to give it back to me at a, at a later date, you know, for a standardized test. Like that's, I mean, I'm, I'm oversimplifying and there's lots of people that recognize the problems with that and are trying to do things differently, but that at its core, right, is, our system, right? And so if you think about that, filling the vessel, it's the wrong thing. Like, especially if you, if Plutarch's right, and it's about kindling a fire, then pouring water on it is the exact wrong thing, right? That, it's, it's actually encouraging you to hate it and to, you know, it's like putting out the flame. And so uh, if we instead adopt that paradigm of like, hey, it's precious when a child asks a question or when somebody's interested in something and they're willing to work at it and learn and improve at it. You know, not everybody's born with unlimited, you know, motivation and drive and discipline and all of this. So I think thinking carefully about how to scaffold and structure it to be supportive of that, but really adopting that paradigm that, you know, you're dealing with little tiny fires that easily go out. I mean, if you've ever tried to start a fire without matches, it's a, uh, it's quite an endeavor, you know, you're doing almost like a, a voodoo dance and trying to like blow on it and, and hope that it stays, um, stays lit. The other person I'll just throw out there that really understood this, his name is Clayton Christensen. Some of your listeners will recognize he was a, a professor at Harvard business school. Um, just a good thinker and really visionary in terms of how, how innovative ideas happen right in the world. And one of the things I got from him picked up from kind of like an obscure podcast, but he, 
he said human brains are like are are like velcro so you take like these two sides of velcro that stick together and he said you can you can have a closed sheet of velcro that you you can like throw stuff at it and it'll just bounce off and that's mo- most of the time like we're spending our brains in this like closed state but what you need is to open the velcro up and then things start sticking and he said um the thing that opens the velcro is asking questions he's like it's all about human agency manifest through asking questions and and so a lot of what i tried to do and looking back i was doing it with the kids i tutored too right is like how can i get you to wonder about this thing how can i get you to ask a question um but yeah that's uh that's it's something that i think is really overlooked i don't think our systems built around these insights i think people get it intuitively but if you look hard at the structure i think we're missing missing huge opportunities uh by doing things the way we're doing them absolutely and uh that's a good segue into prenda can you just tell us what prenda is sure so prenda is a is a company we're just a business in education technology but our goal is to support micro schools so if you uh think of somebody in a community that you know maybe is a former teacher maybe is a you know, a piano teacher or sports coach, or maybe they're a paraprofessional, or maybe they're a, a parent, right? There's lots of different groups of people, but this adult says, I want to create educational opportunities for the people in my, in my ecosystem. That person, um, you know, in the past, their choice was you either go try to volunteer at the school or you go start your own school. It's a big, a big lift. What we're doing is saying, let's build around you will create the opportunity for you to do a micro school. This is up to 10 kids meeting in an informal space. So a lot of people will use a home or an office or community center, really anywhere that's safe for kids. You run school basically. So we give you all the tools and uh, curriculum, everything you need to be successful at that. But the, um, yeah, the basic idea is, is you step up as what's what we call a learning guide uh, to be the, the adult that's there day to day uh, supporting learning. I really appreciate that aspect of like a learning guide. Like they don't necessarily have to be experts in what they're guiding you on. Correct. Right. Yeah. There was a time hundreds of years ago, even decades ago where, um, the only way information passed from, you know, human to human was like, somebody knows it and they tell it to somebody who doesn't know it. Um, but we, our world has changed, right? Information's abundant. There's lots of places to, to go for learning. Um, and it's much more about how do I support learning? You know, how do I unblock learning? Like there's all these reasons why people don't learn. And so being there for them in that capacity, and we use the word guide deliberately to say that's, it's different than I teach you, right? You sit there and I give you knowledge. It's, um, it's about helping you learn. And what's the origin story of Prenda? How did that get started? So it goes back to that code club. Um, I was doing that every week uh, as an after school program. So a couple hours a week for about five years. And I got to work with so many kids, just all different types from like all over the place, lots of different backgrounds and meeting these kids and seeing them engage with computer programming. Uh, I got to notice some things about the way kids learn, right? So early days I prepared lessons and I um, would draw on the, on the board with my whiteboard marker and I would bring a kid up for a a demonstration. I think I was a pretty good engaging teacher, but what, um, but what I noticed was, uh, I was the Charlie Brown teacher. You know, I would just see like, I could see it not working. It was like, wah, 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 wah. Like these kids were like, not, it just wasn't effective. And so I was able to sort of through trial and error, get to this model that really mimicked how I've learned as an adult, like since leaving school, which is like, I have some reason, I have some question, I go find answers to that question, I find skills that I don't have that can fill it in. Um, And so instead of bringing them material, I started bringing them challenges. And I would write on the board, today's challenge of the week, uh, you know, and I would draw like a quick graphic stick figures of like, roughly what maybe the game or the the project should do. And then just a few bullets, there's lots of flexibility in how they can do it. And it was completely optional. You don't have to do the challenge of the week, but if you do, you know, we do this show and tell at the end where you're 
your work is put up on a big screen and you get a microphone to like explain and kids felt very motivated by all of this, right? It was, it was driven around um, learning because humans were choosing to learn. And that was a, a very powerful thing. And I got to see, as I noticed that working, I started to see like, well, why are these same kids that are coming to Coke Club struggling in their traditional environments? I got to know a lot of them, I got to know their families. Some of these kids were getting suspended for behavior problems or getting bad grades or, um, you know, many of them had this conception of themselves as dumb or broken or not, you know, not a good student. And I'm looking at them code and I'm thinking, there's no problem with your brain. You know, you're, you're totally capable. It's just uh, for other reasons. Um, it's not, it's not clicking for you. And so at that point, um, I started to ask the question like, well, what would this look like if it wasn't just coding and it wasn't just after school? Like, what if this was a, <laughs> what if this was school? Right. And, and we applied these same principles and that was the same time I started doing research and noticing like, you know, we've got a whole bunch of, um, there's a whole bunch of people that have thought about this stuff. In fact, nothing Prenda's doing is new. Um, you know, you look all the way back to Maria Montessori who understood like what a, a guide could be and, and their role in sort of encouraging a child to take ownership. If you look at, um, you know, Piaget and constructivists, uh, there's these people that are, you know, have definitely like put together models. Um, and, and more recently with the advent of technology, you know, blended learning is this way to personalize instruction and allow kids to always be right at their learning frontier instead of, you know, maybe spending a lot of time waiting, waiting on the class or, or spending time lost and, and discouraged um, giving kids an opportunity to, uh, to work at the pace that makes sense for them. So these ideas all exist. They already had existed. Um, there was research about them. I was kind of stumbling into them through the code club and then putting this all together. It was like, well, I could do this. Let's just try, you know, try to do it ourselves. So I, that's when I, um, you know, I pulled my kid out of school. My friends pulled their kids out of school and we had a micro school in my house with me and seven kids. And, and it was one semester we were able to just, my question was like, can this even work? Like, is there something we can learn from this? Not only did it work, I mean, and, and I will tell you, I could tell you personal stories of each of those children really like you could see the fire burning for them, right? Like they were, they were getting to that point, they were getting academic results um, and they were learning all these things that never show up on a test, but I could tell it was just like, it was, what you want in the next generation, um, the type of, of grit and, and mindset and things like that. Um, it's, it was all good. The parents noticed it too. And they started talking about next year and, and telling their friends and, and pretty soon we were, we were growing. So we went from that initial seven over a period of a year and a half, we were at a thousand students all over Arizona. Um, wow. and then COVID came <laughs> and we, uh, and then, you know, when schools shut down and lots of people talking about this, this idea became normalized and mainstream, um, much faster than I expected it to. And, and that was really exciting, uh, as well. It was stressful because we had so many, so many people, we can talk about all of that, but hopefully that answers the origin story question. No, I mean, I think that. In terms of education innovation, I do feel like COVID sort of pushed us a little bit into the future. And yeah, what just if you could talk a little bit more about what COVID happening, you know, did to Prenda. Yeah, so I think uh, two things happened. One is, um, you know, the the learning got pushed into people's living rooms, and it got pushed through the pipes of of Zoom or, or WebEx. So you got to see, as a parent, you got to see firsthand. Like, what is this anyway? You know, I send my kid every day. There's this implicit promise in this, which is um, send me your kids for 13 years every day. And then at the end of 13 years, they will have this piece of paper and they will be ready for life in some in some sense. Right. And I think parents never really paused to check on that. It's like, does that feel right? Like, is that is that really what I want? And who am I sending them to? And Yeah, no one really thinks twice about it in general. <laughs> it's just like, oh, you just send your kids to school. Yeah. And we're deliberate, you know, I think we're a discerning group of consumers in other aspects of our life. And you think about choosing a cell phone plan or, you know, we're researching this stuff, but, uh, on school, it was, it just wasn't that way. Um, maybe it's like, I want to move into a good neighborhood, um, with the, you know, the school rated well, I think some of the pushback on that has just been 
the school ratings are tied to test scores and test scores are tied to how right. wealthy and educated are the parents anyway, right? So there's these problems with it. It's like, nobody's really asking the question of, is the model working? Is it doing what I want? And so now it's all of a sudden it's in our living rooms and we're watching it. And I think a lot of people kind of at least asked the question and, and came to a variety of, of answers. Um, I think the other thing that happened, because even if you are the type of person that's asking those questions and maybe you're dissatisfied, is you have a, um, you're, you're kind of pushed into a passive mode or you have, when I mean, you think of like a parent who really cares, right? And is involved and maybe, you know, has a degree in education even. And it's like, I want to be involved. It's like, you can go the full track of like becoming a teacher in the schools. Most people don't do that. You could like show up at the school and try to volunteer, but ultimately, you know, you're going to spend time running bake sales. You're going to spend time uh, stapling papers in the back of the room, or maybe you get a little breakout group of struggling readers and you get to spend time, you know, supporting a child in their process of reading. All that work's important, but I think um, what happened during COVID was because everything else was broken, it's like, what if I do it, right? And so you see things like there was a Facebook group that popped up called like Pandemic Pods and Microschools. This was just parents that said, we could put together our own educational environments in ways that make sense for us. And there's room for so much variation and so much energy. And maybe we can do it in a way that, you know, does light fires or it supports the, uh, the burning of, of fires without putting them out. And so when you saw that, right, parents stepping up, creating it, creating these environments, um, for us, that was similar to like, I want to send my kids to Prenda is like phase one, but it's actually, it's like, I want to make a micro school, right? I, I don't care. Yeah. I'm not sending my kids to Prenda. I'm, Prenda's helping me to, to create a micro school. And that can be a transformational experience, not just for my child, but for me, right? In my community. And so uh, you had people step up in that way. It's very like empowering and um, right, right to the adults that maybe hadn't been involved in the process before. So those two changes really did change uh, a lot. And those are both here to stay. I mean, you see this in parents. I talk to parents all the time, right? This is still, these are still on their minds. You know, maybe that model isn't accomplishing what I want it to accomplish for my child. And maybe instead of just complaining about it or showing up at the school board or, you know, volunteering with the PTO, maybe it's, um, it's like I can create something different. And that's super exciting for some people. How many micro schools are you guys working with now? We're in the 300s. Um, area. I mean, it's wow. kind of spans. We, we definitely expanded during COVID because we had interest from other states. So we got to meet, um, you know, school leaders, both inside the public school system or charter schools, or even um, we've, we had some allies pop up from regulatory bodies, right? People who are involved in sort of administering the um, school system. And for those people, um, you know, they, during COVID, I think it, the same types of questions, right? The same types of observations were happening for them. And so they reached out and, and we've been able to open up partnerships, uh, you know, currently in five states, we're constantly looking for, you know, for those types of people, we wanna work with, work with anybody really, because we see ourselves as a partner in changing education and opening up possibilities for, um, for more and more kids, more and more families. And how more specifically do you support these micro schools? Yeah. So um, if you start with the top, right, we will, we decided it needed, needs to be free to families um, because we didn't want to exclude people that can't pay for school. Most of my upbringing was, you know, like I said, I went to public school. My, nobody I knew in my life was paying for some sort of private education and, and frankly couldn't, right. It just wasn't in the cards for the, you know, kind of middle class background that I came, I came from. Um, I think what we said was, okay, this needs to be free to families using public dollars. Uh, that means we partner. And so we go form partnerships with, like I said, district schools, charter schools, uh, school choice programs. We'll work with anybody and we put this partnership in place. So that's kind of step one. Step two then is you can be a, you can run a micro school. And so we, we give them that, give them permission and resources of how to do it. Um, that includes rigorous checks on safety. For example, we have to make sure that the, the people are vetted and safe. We spend a lot of time 
looking at, you know, the, the physical, you know, like, does, does the space safe for children? Is there an internet filter in place so that kids are protected from harmful content? So a lot of work on safety and then, um, and then the tools to run, to run the micro school, right? So that includes standards aligned educational curriculum that's done in a way um, of children driving their education and doing it in a personalized mastery based way. So example of that is child shows up. It's like, I'm working on math today. I'm a fourth grader. I got to get through fourth grade math by the end of the year. I'm trying to get these two lessons mastered by today. And so I'm consuming, you know, video lectures. I'm reading through tutorials. I'm answering questions in a kind of formative assessment way. I know I'm throwing some jargon at you a little bit here, but if you have education people reading this, that will hopefully, or listening to this. Um, and then, yeah. And then as they're doing that learning, they can see, did I accomplish today's goal, right? Did I learn what I needed to for the day? So that's great for educational outcomes because you have mastery that compounds and builds over time. But it's also great for life outcomes because now you have a self-actualized learner, right? Somebody who says, I like, I, I see what I want. I set big goals. I break it up into small goals. I attack each small goal and I know if I accomplished it or not. Right. And then I go back tomorrow if I didn't, and I, you know, make up for it and, and continue. So that's a, it's like a type of person that we're trying to, um, develop with, with the model. And so we put that all together. We support the learning guide through it. We support the kids and their families through it. Um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of operational and, um, you know, complex aspects to, to doing education and to do it, to doing it differently like we are. Um, but it's actually been fascinating to see what happens with a child who's given that, um, that invitation to step up and take more ownership of their education. Let's say there's somebody listening that's interested in starting a micro school. What do you suggest are the steps they take? Please do it. Prenda.com. You can learn all about what, what we're doing. Um, there are people that might say, oh, I don't, you know, I don't want to do it that way. I want to do it a different way. You can do that too. I mean, Prenda exists to support you. Um, but yeah, I would say the, the main thing is, uh, is do it. <laughs> I think you get a lot of people that are like, oh, I could, I could maybe do that, but it seems scary or, or maybe they just daunting, right? Yeah. Um, no, what I found is some of our very best learning guides are people that didn't think of themselves as a great learning guide, right? They just, um, they just love kids and they're willing to be there for the humans. I mean, really what we're talking about is can you help kindle a fire for the mind of, of a young child? And, um, and that has to do at least as much with who you are as a person as it does with, you know, your, your skills and your techniques. Uh, and we provide you a lot of support in, in doing that. So uh, make sure, you know, we'll make, we'll make sure with you that they're learning how to read and do math and, and do all, you know, cover all the basics. We have this team of professional educators that's designing the whole system and supporting it. So, so those are in place um, for you, you know, to support you. That's awesome. And then I, I'm sure people, you know, that are new to this concept may wonder as well, like, what is sort of, is there like any kind of process to make it official to ensure that like your kids are getting the credit they need? Like, I personally don't know how that works. So yeah, there's two different answers to that. So if you're in one of our five core states, um, then we will, you'll be enrolled with a partner school um, working inside of rough, roughly, most people are working inside of a system. So you just transfer smoothly from Prenda covers K through eight. So from eighth grade straight into ninth grade, you can go, um, you can just go directly and, and everything's smooth sailing. Um, if you're not, then it's, it's more like, it looks more like homeschool and you'll come in, um, you know, say you stay with Prenda through eighth grade and then you go as a ninth grader to a new school. It's just going to be more about like, what do you know? And some, some placement. Now, the good news there is you've got kids who have learned how to learn, right? They're, they're an empowered learner. They, um, they're confident in their abilities. And, and so they're able to, um, you know, jump in and, and pick up with, you know, we've, we've had kids transfer into the highest performing, you know, uh, most intense, like academically intense charter schools that exist and, and magnet schools. Um, 
And so it's, it's really about like, if, if I'm an empowered learner, I know how to learn and do it. Um, I'm going to be, I'm going to be fine anywhere. And K through eight actually simplifies that because it's not about high school credits and some of the things that get a little more complicated for folks. So do you expect to sort of stop at eighth grade? That's where we stop today. Yeah. But ongoing, like, I don't know. I mean, I, I haven't committed i'm sure if yeah if prenda parents are listening to this i I get emails every day that's like when when are you going to open high school you know i don't want to send my kid to to kind of a traditional setting they really don't want to go like and we just have to kind of apologize we do you know form partnerships with there are you know a variety of options for high school and so there's people that think about things the way we do um but yeah, for now, we just, because we're new and we're really focused, it's let's nail this experience for K through eight. Got it. That, that makes a lot of sense. And um, I'm curious, is there, you know, is, is this a for-profit business? If so, like what's the business model? It is. Yeah. So we structured this as a company. Um, I'd call it a, a mission-driven business. So. And, and I want to interject briefly, like I, I've been going on these tangents lately about I don't like the for-profit nonprofit distinction because I think a sustainable impact business is better long-term anyway. You know, if you're, if you're putting it towards positive change, like I'd rather it be a sustainable business. Yeah. I think that's really the question is like, what are you trying to do in the world? Right. And my answer to that's very clear. I want to empower learners. I see what's happening for those seven kids from my first micro school to the thousands of kids that are doing it today. You see this transformation of learning and I want that to be available to as many people as possible. What that means is I've got to create the organization that can do it. And I've run a nonprofit. You know, I've been, I have a lot of friends running nonprofits. Um, Many of them complain to me about perpetually begging for money, basically, right? Like my job is to go around and and fundraise all the time. Yeah, Yeah, that's my problem with nonprofits. It's all they focus on oftentimes. They don't get to do a lot of the work they want to do. You have to. Like that's your business is managing those relationships and keeping the lights on. Um, And so to do it in a way that, self-sustains. I mean, there's this a, a engine, an economic engine in the way businesses work um, that for better or worse, and it has its challenges for sure, but um, it's the best one we've got. So what's what's the Mark Twain quote? It's like the worst, it's the worst, capitalism's the worst, except for everything else we've tried. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's basically like where we're at is like, this is a, a model that um, an economic approach to uh, building this out and having this impact that I actually think puts us in the highest probability of succeeding at it. It's not to say you can't succeed as nonprofit. There's people doing really good work. Um, But when I thought about the impact and scale that I want to have, that made the most sense for for us. And that's opened the door. We have investors that have put millions of dollars toward this. Um, You know, we've been able to spend more money than we were making, right? And so what that means is it allows us to build out the infrastructure. And, and this is, again, it's all complex. There's a lot that needs to be solved to be able to do this. So apologies if I missed it. Where does the money come? Where does the cash flow in? Yeah, so free to families because the uh, you know people pay taxes. So there's money for education with the state. Okay. The state gives money to schools. We partner with the schools. So we will be the kind of the micro school is one option underneath the school. And so we will have an agreement like, for those kids that choose micro school, Got it. we will be their provider and they the state uses some of the funding that they get from the, or the school uses some of the funding they get from the state to pay us, which, you know, a, a good portion of that goes straight to the learning guides who are running the micro schools. And, you know, you've been at this for over six years now. How has Prenda evolved over that time? Oh, it's like, how is it not? It's been um, just a very fast, you know, I mentioned right at the top, I love learning. And uh, if you're out there and you love learning, I'd say start a company. It's it's crazy to do. There's some uh, there's some psychopathy in it probably, but um, but it's the best way to uh, to develop and to learn. And so I'm in, you know, we've been in this mode. We started with a very, you know, it was very emergent, very natural, very organic with um, the code club and experiences I was having. There's the the leap of faith, like quitting my day job and diving in and opening a micro school in my house. Um, and then to find people that believe in what we're doing and, and build a team around around this mission and, and cause. I mean, I feel just overwhelmed with gratitude for the people I get to 
work with on this. These are some of the the most, um, they're not only stellar technically and really strong leaders and contributors, but they're, um, they're just solid humans, right? They want good things to happen in the world and they see this as a way of uh, making their contribution and, and unlocking great results for people. So all of that happening, we've been through um, periods like during COVID periods of uh, demand that were so far outstripping our capacity and our ability that everything felt like it was breaking and falling apart. Um, we tried to quickly react to that and build up the company that could sustain it and support it. And then by the time we did that, COVID, you know, was kind of coming to an end and families were going back to traditional school. And so our numbers went down and, and that was challenging too, right? Cause now it's like, we've got too big of a company and we have to adapt. And so it's been, I mean, every, at every stage, what I can say about where we're at right now is, um, you know, we've, we've built a platform and a, a structure that supports scale and it works for, um, you know, we're doing it in five states today and we just feel really excited about the ability to take this model to as many kids as we can reach all over the U.S. I'm excited to watch as, as you grow and evolve further. And um, for, you know, we talked about those listening that might be interested in starting a micro school. What about someone that is just curious to know if there are Prenda micro schools in their area? Uh, is that something they can look up on your site? Yeah. So at onprenda.com, it will, you know, if you think you're, you want to be a guide, there's clear, like become a guide messaging. And then there's also um, find a micro school. And, and so, yeah, you can, you can get in there and check it out. We do have a platform that you can do either as homeschool or you can kind of build your own micro school. We don't provide the supports for it that we do, you know, when we're partnering with, with schools. Um, so it's much simpler and, and smaller, but yeah, if, if you're excited about this, um, get on there, you can, you can start your own, um, little group or do it with your own kids, uh, right away. And we would hope that you would jump on and join and be part of the community. There's, there's just so much excitement around micro schools and what's possible with opening, um, opening this up for, for children. Are there any micro schools that you work with that are particular, particularly interesting or unique that you'd be interested in sharing with us? Oh, wow. Jeffrey, there's so many. I mean, each one's unique, right? So um, we've seen, let me just, I'll just rattle off a few. Um, we've seen groups focusing specifically on, um, on different populations, right? So let's take one that I know in Phoenix that's, that said, we love, uh, we just feel like resources for kids with autism is not is not there. And so you have these, um, these children with, you know, special needs that really make it hard for them to thrive in a traditional system. And these loving adults that have been able to create just incredible opportunities for those kids. Uh, similarly, you take uh, for various communities, we have um, a group of inner city moms that, that got together and formed a micro school for, for black kids, specifically the Black Mothers Forum. We have a group in Central Phoenix that's um, really serving, it's connected to a faith community and serving um, folks where the parents are predominantly Spanish speaking. And so you have this, this group of kids um, coming up that you know they, they wanted to create an awesome educational experience. We've done work in Native American communities as well. Uh, in rural communities, it's been very exciting. You see um, another kind of dimension of this type of um, of this type of work is, is actually on not just who do you serve, but how do you do it, right? Everybody, everybody learns how to read, everybody learns math, but uh, we have examples of some of these groups that have chosen to really customize the experience in one way or another. So whether that's a real focus on U.S. history, and I've seen groups emulating the Constitutional Convention and walking through really living like some of the, the pressing issues of our of our country. Uh, I've seen groups form, um, you know, an interest in, in running or sports or, you know, entering themselves into robotics competitions or, or something like that. I've seen groups, um, you know, that have really taken a performing arts angle on this and they, they've written and produced their own, you know, plays, dramatic plays with even dance and original music and things like that. Um, you see groups that do animal you know, like animal care and agriculture where they're involved with raising up um, chickens or pigs or goats. Um, I'm trying to think there's some that have, have taken a technology 
focus. I mean, there's so much room for, it's like, what would you want to do? And, and what I love about it is there's not like a top down right answer. Like I want to give you the platform. Obviously I do believe that reading and math are, are going to be part of that platform for everybody. Like those are fundamental things. Um, but there's so much flexibility to kind of tailor it the way that, that, that really unlocks, again, it's all about how do we light that fire uh, for the young people in our class? Yeah. I mean, it's really exciting to hear about the variety of ways that, that people are, are teaching and uh, kids are learning. Um, it's, it's exciting to think about to even, you know, to go back, imagine myself in school, which to be honest, I was bored a lot of the time. Yeah. And to think that hopefully my kids are going to get these types of opportunities to, like you said, kindle that fire. Um, it just, it really excites me for the future that, you know, we're starting to trend in this direction. I think about those kids. I've gotten to meet several of them that were just clearly bored in a traditional setting and to like spend time sitting with them and say, Hey, you don't have to stop here. Right. You, you know, maybe math is something interesting to you and you're good at it. Uh, instead of just expecting this of you, like you could do this, you could do calculus by the end of this year, if you wanted, if you, you know, if you're really serious about it and here's the path and here's access to all that, all that learning. Um, then what that does is it kind of, it switches modes, right? Instead of just, I'm going to jump through hoops. I'm going to sit here and let my, my vessel be filled. It's like, no, I'm going to like light on fire and do what I want to do. And I just, I, I love these experiences. I, I just had a conversation with my son last night about, you know, a, an internet business that he was thinking about starting. And we were looking up kind of what are the manufacturing components? I mean, he's a sophomore now in high school, but he was in that initial, I love that initial in my house but it's like to be 15 16 and you know able to generate real income on your own um selling like guitar cases online or whatever whatever it is you want to do it's like that is uh something that's just powerful if you imagine that spread to lots and lots of people uh i see it as just so exciting not just for those people but for all of us right like they're the people that are going to solve the world's problems so we need we need more of them yeah, that's really cool to hear about. I love hearing about uh, the entrepreneurial drive in young people. And um, this is a good opportunity for me to shout out Rocket Club, my friend, uh, Alex Hodera's after school program. He was my first ever guest on the podcast. And uh, kids ages 7 to 14 learn coding, robotics, entrepreneurship. And, you know, they're seven year olds starting their own business. And, you know, Alex would tell me that sometimes parents would come and say, my, my kids can't do this. And he's like, no, they can. Like, check it out. And, they do it and they start their businesses. And um, it's just like, you know, if you give somebody the tools and kind of guide them along the path, you can make it happen. And um, it's exciting to see. There was this moment in our early um, parenting, our, our, our son was just a baby and he was having trouble sleeping through the night. Um, and we finally like, you know, you talk to all your friends and it's like, how do you get a child to sleep through the night? And there was a book that we finally like, we just picked the book. We said, this book feels right to us. And there's lots of different philosophies and this is not a comment on it. But one of the things the book talked about is allowing children to fuss a little bit in their bed and self-soothe and put themselves to sleep. Um, and we realized part of the problem was, you know, recognizing like we, as new parents, were just so quick to like be there for our child. Like we didn't want them to fuss or, or anything. And so, um, so reading this book, it was like, okay, we need to change paradigms and um and what was interesting about this and this i promise this does get back to what you just said <laughs> is there was this moment where i was physically blocking my wife from entering the room right like i'm boxing out because she wants to be there like even though she knows yeah. we've both read the book we know that this isn't actually helpful to our child but it's like i just can't not do that and i think similarly we apply these fear-based limiting beliefs as parents and adults. We apply them to children in ways that we think is protective, right? Like I'm helping by going in to soothe the baby. Um, but it actually is, it's crippling them, right? It's limiting what they're, what they're really capable of. And, um, and so I do see some of my work as you know, boxing out is, is a pretty rough, um, uh, you know, term, but it's, it's educating parents and really helping them to find that, that discipline, like to agree with me and to choose not to cripple, not to, not to apply limiting beliefs to these children who are capable of so much more 
than we might think, right? And, th- and that's something that I get really excited about. Well, it's definitely come through in our conversation, but just to ask you straightforward, what would you tell someone is your general philosophy around education? Yeah, so uh, humans, the, like the power in humans is greater than, like I think we're just constantly underestimating it. I think we all underestimate it. So it's it's treat that as it should be treated, which is um, really like a sacred thing. This is special. It's, um, it's something that is so precious. Just like if you're trying to start a fire uh, without matches and you get a little spark. It's like, I don't want that spark to go out. I'm going to do everything I can to fan that flame and and turn it into a real fire. Um, I think, yeah, philosophy wise, I I think it's, um, I'm trying to think of how to frame this one. I think agencies, you know, we've talked about a lot, right? This idea of encouraging questions and get kids to open up their sheet of Velcro. I think the way to do that um, is is trickier than it seems, right? Because it's not just like sit there with your arms folded and say, okay, fine, tell me, you know, what you want to learn. Like, give me a question. Um, it's it's much more loving and, and careful than that. Um, and so you, you really are being deliberately, you, you need to deliberately scaffold a path to asking more and better questions. Um, and one of those things is, you know, seeing it modeled in yourself, right? Be a learner yourself. One of those things is kids are, are watching how you respond to them and to their questions. And if it's, you know, if you're saying, um, <laughs> if you're, even if you're saying the right words, but you come across as annoyed or like you are an obstacle to my happiness, which I think happens all the time in classrooms and in houses, right? With parents, it's, uh, it's very normal. Um, and then, and I think it's work on us to really re- revise that, right? And to and to get clear inside of our hearts, because kids, they have the best BS detectors out of anybody, right? They know exactly what's going on with us, and they, you know, I think we want to believe that we're so good at. It's no, you're not. Like they know, they know exactly how you feel. And if you're, you know, say treating a child in the way that you know matches the policy of the school, but then going into the teacher's lounge and talking total trash about them. And they're, you know, complaining about that. It's like, guess what? Like the kid knows that. And, um, and so you have to really do that work on yourself to be, you know, and if, and maybe it's not like, maybe you can't get to a point of, I care about this person as a person and I can give them the respect and decency, but I would, you know, assert humbly that maybe that's not, um, then you shouldn't be the one trying to do it, right? Like find somebody that can, because I think so much of, yeah, so much of the limitations have been imposed on children by us, right? By us adults. And so I'm all about removing those limitations, unlocking people. And again, I I, I don't feel like I'm articulating this well, but there is a whole book about it coming. So I'll, I'll make sure to send it to you when we're ready. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to, to your book. Absolutely. And, uh, definitely makes sense in terms of your philosophy and appreciate you going into those details. And um, I'm curious, is there a time that you recall where you just directly saw the impact that your work was making that really hit you? This is an interesting question around education because uh, it takes time. You know, Mm -hmm. there's one of the books uh, that I like is it uses this analogy of gardeners and carpenters and a carpenter, like, they're both hard work. The carpenter gets to do the work and see what they made right away. Mm. Um, Gardeners though, which is what I'm arguing we are in education is you're planting these seeds and you're creating the conditions and then you wait. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot that's outside of your control and there's a lot of time embedded in it. Um, And so, no, you don't, you don't get to see, you get moments, right? You get moments and glimpses and the joys of, of children. I'll tell uh, maybe two quick stories. One of them is actually goes back to Code Club. So I had been doing this Code Club. Honestly, my like starting hypothesis with Code Club was um, coding's important. Maybe some kid will, like everybody can have fun with it. So that'll be great. We'll have fun. But maybe one kid likes it enough to kind of stick with it and they get a job, right? Like that was, and their their life could be benefited um, with that. Well, um, 
you know, it's years later, I've moved on and I'm doing the, the micro schools and my wife and I are getting a burrito at a place in town. And these strangers that I did not recognize came up and just started hugging me, right? They were like, oh, wow. uh, it was just really overwhelming, right? And uh, and I was like, I'm so sorry, like, I don't recognize you. And they're like, we are so-and-so's parents. And they talked about one of the boys that came to the early, early code club when he was 12 or 13 years old, but it had now been a while. And he was graduating from high school. He was going into major in computer science. They both, they, the parents said like, look, we're not, we don't have technology skills. Like that wasn't in our house. Like they wouldn't, he wouldn't be on this path um, without the code club happening. And, and that's, you know, those moments just feel really good. Like, yeah, that's awesome. an impact. I of course didn't create it. Like this kid, he was one of these just astonishing people, but he came and, and created the opportunity. Yeah. yeah. We got to, yeah, we got to be, be part of someone's story is just to be, is a really overwhelming feeling. Um, another one's a little shorter term, but um, we had, we have an exercise in Prenda where during early in the school year, we will ask kids, um, we'll ask kids about their future self. It's like, we do this exercise. You're going to create a, like a, physical representation, whether it's like a painting or a sculpture or something that represents your yourself 30 years from now. Um, and the idea is to, you know, begin with the end in mind and think about what do you like that? What would you like that person to be? And what are you doing now to sort of help that person become what you want them to be? Um, and it's an interesting exercise and we get all kinds of fun. You know, a lot of kids are really ambitious and they've got big dreams and and then to connect it to, okay, well, here are things that I could do literally this school year that would help me uh, move in that direction. So it's a powerful exercise. Well, one of the kids in my class, um, <laughs> one of the kids did the exercise and he, you know, he's, he's just one of these kids that I think had a lot of narratives around himself as a learner. Um, he's, he's busy as a kid. He likes to move around. He wasn't like, didn't consider himself gifted academically at different topics. And teachers were mostly frustrated with him, right? Because he would kind of disrupt and just be in mild ways, like wasn't, wasn't sort of the type of student that they were like trying to encourage everyone to be. And so, um, you know, he, he got that message like loud and clear. And I think he had picked it up and then created a little bit of a you know, personal armor of protection against that. And he did that through his attitude. And so we do this exercise. He makes out of Play-Doh a version of himself seated on a couch with like a soda in one hand and the remote control in the other hand. And he's watching TV. And I'm like, I'm like, okay, so this is like the version of you 30 years from now that you like hope, hope becomes true. And it's like, yeah, that would be great. Like, I would love to just sit on the couch and watch TV. And I'm like, awesome. Talk, let's talk to me about that life. And I tried all the things like, you know, what, like, how do you pay for your soda and your TV cable package and who bought the chair and where does the money come from? And how, you know, you know, like all the things that you would want to do, but he was not having it. He just wasn't budging. Right. Like he just, he continued to just kind of be, I call it like a stinker, right? He was just like, I'm going to be a stinker about this. Well, uh, I let it go. We, you know, we move on we do other things. It's months later, like towards the end of the school year, maybe six months later. Um, and he's had plenty of opportunities now to start seeing himself differently as a learner, right? Not the problem child in the class, not deficient in some way. He's got gifts and abilities. And in fact, specific to computer programming, I introduced him to some of these tools that let you learn coding. And he latched onto them. He's really fascinated with, with the work, um, just like the mechanics of, of having to make a computer do what you want it to do. And he found that interesting enough that, um, you know, I had this conversation with him and he was talking about doing a, a PhD in computer science. And again, same kid, six months later, he's 10. Quite the turn. I'm like, yeah, I just want to like hold this up for you. Like six months ago, it was like, my view of myself is sitting on the couch watching TV. And now you're saying like, I'm going to work hard at this educational outcome that could open up all kinds of career opportunities for me. I'm like, do you see, like, you're totally capable of it. And he was funny. He's like, yeah, you know, I still like to I still want to watch TV. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of course you do. Um, but yeah, just, just to be able to see that change in somebody, um, 
and to be part of that is uh it's it's humbling it's exciting it, it just energizes me it keeps me getting out of bed every day it's, um it's, that's happening yeah i can imagine why that gets you out of bed that's awesome um and you know it sounds like you've certainly been there for for a lot of kids as they've gone through the educational process has there been anyone through your kind of career journey that you've considered a mentor oh so many um i have i mean i could t i could point to several right now um that i talk to you about entrepreneurship and business and leadership challenges and um if you go back to early days my first job out of school i had a um a manager he was a, the owner of the small consulting firm who just was willing to sit with me and I, I had all kinds of questions because i have this obsession with learning and so i would say hey john can i can i come talk to you about this this is what i'm seeing what do you think about this he didn't have to do that you know he's successful this was his third business he's made tons of money um it's doing well and and this brand new guy right out of school is you know inter you know interrupting my work which i'm sure he would like would have preferred me to just sit down and do my work um, but I had these questions and he would, he would talk to me about it and he was interested in, in engaging with me and he liked sort of entertaining my sort of out of the box ideas about things. And, um, so a huge, huge mentorship from John Katowski way back. And there's just so many, I mean, I could point to lots and lots of, of people along the way. Yeah. I think successful, successful entrepreneurs and innovators and impact tend to surround themselves with great people and they tend to understand, you know, what they don't know and how to lean on people to learn. So uh, it, that definitely comes through. Absolutely. Uh, if you'd like, you can ask me a question. Give me your, give me a mentor in your life, Jeffrey. I'd love to hear hear about one. Have you talked about this on the show already? Mm, maybe I have. I mean, it's for me. It's when I think of a mentor. Like, I think similarly, there's been a lot of people over the years, but it's hard for me. It, it's probably an easy answer for a lot of people, but. Um, it's hard for me to go anywhere about my dad, you know, unfortunately he passed away uh, in 2008, but, um, you know, just learned a, a tremendous amount from him about how to treat people, how to, you know, try to create impact in everything that you do. And, um, I lean on his lessons every day of my life or, you know, regardless of it being, you know, 14 years or whatever it's been, um, and, you know, my, so my parents both, you know, my dad and then my mom as well has just been incredible to lead on. And those are probably <laughs> cop out answers, but no. um, yeah, those are the first two that come to mind and um, certainly a lot of others along the way, but you got to give them props. I love it. All right. If, if everything ends tomorrow, what are you most proud of? If everything ends tomorrow, what am I most proud of? The, the word proud in that question is problematic. Okay. I feel enormous gratitude for like, you know, we just talked about being the part of being part of somebody else's story mm -hmm. um, multiplied by thousands. Now, you know, I, I do see, I take great joy in that. I feel gratitude in it. I feel, um, you know, some element of like luck or just the way that the, the people got placed in the path and the ideas came and, um, and so I do feel really good about like a lot of good feelings about all of that. And that includes, you know, the team at Prenda early days team, many of whom have moved on and done other things. The people that are in the trenches with me building this, um, uh, partners and supporters are learning guides that step up and run micro schools, the families that trust us with this new model and, um, and participate with us. So, so gratitude and and joy around all of that. Um, I think proud of maybe the, the place where I might give myself pride is, um, is saying yes to it. You know, there's a, there's a choice everybody gets to make. Um, I think Teddy Roosevelt compared it to, you know, sitting in the stands or, or getting in the arena and, um, and it's harder in the arena, you know, to, to make that choice, to dive in there and, and participate, you end up with, you know, I think the quote is dust and blood and sweat, you know, and, and it's, um, I, I didn't have to do it. I think nobody has to do it. There's a way to live life. We live, you know, we, many of us have 
you know, been blessed to be born into um, a world where, you know, it's just, you don't have to do that. But I do, um, I feel like that decision was given to me and I've taken it and I'm, I'm proud of that. You know, I, th I feel like despite the, the pain and the struggle of it, there's so much learning and growth and so much opportunity in there for the stuff that really matters. Um, and I'm great. I'm grateful and, and happy that, yeah. that I made that choice. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a really good point that you make. It's easy to go the easy way, you know, and to not go along this more difficult path that might be more rewarding. And um, I'm certainly glad that you went down this path. Me too. So my big question is kind of the last major one that I ask everyone if you could snap your fingers and fix one thing in the world, what would it be? And how do you think that change would reverberate? Ooh, that's a huge question. It is. If I could snap my fingers, look, I, um, I'm going to stick in the domain of humans limiting themselves, but I'm actually going to do it in the context of, um, of our engagement with other people, right? Like my finger snap would be, um, would be like clear vision of, of the human being, like instead of seeing a label, instead of seeing a tribe, a competing faction, an enemy, um, I think our society is, is really plagued by this, this idea of that, which has been human nature all along, but sort of choosing your side and then hating the other side with a, um, you know, an infinite zeal. I think instead of that, um, being able to identify the core humanity in every other human being, um, I think it's, it's, it's a cultural disease. I mean, like I said, it's been there for a long time, but I, I see it getting worse and I see it preventing, um, preventing the kind of, uh, real work that needs to be done, right? Like how can you, in the educational setting, how can you truly unlock, help someone kindle a fire if you see them as, you know, a category on a special ed worksheet or you see them as um, an obstacle, a behavior problem in your class, or you see them as, you know, a, a demographic or something. It's like, you have to be able to see humans. And if you can see a human being, there's this sense of like value like I, I automatically value human life and potential. And that's this, this kind of reverence for what you are and what you're capable of. Um, again, I'm dead serious. Like we're not going to solve the, the problems of the world. Like my generation is not going to do it. Like we need more help. And it's, it's in these kids. It's, it's in some ways, you know, the Obi-Wan Kenobi, like it's our only hope kind of thing. It's like, we, we need this generation um, but you have to be able to see that, right? If you can't see that, um, you're going to limit and block and, and make it worse. So, uh, yeah, that would be my snap the finger moment is to free people from all the things getting in the way and allow them clear visibility to the human beings around them, a real understanding of, of who these people are and how they should be treated and seen. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. And I, I hope we're moving toward a world more like that. Um, and it's been amazing having you. It's been inspiring hearing your story. Uh, how can people that are listening support you and your impact? Well, I love, I mean, we're building a, a movement, a community. I love for people to reach out if they've got ideas and they're, you know, they're, they're feeling energy and resonance around this. Kelly at Prenda.com is, is my email address. So just reach out directly to me. Um, if you want to participate in the community, run a micro school yourself. If you're in one of our five core states, um, you could step up and start a micro school right now, you know, and, and create this opportunity for families. If you're not in our five states, you can still work with us and um, open, you know, open up opportunities for for young people. So, would love to invite you to to join the fun and uh, and be part of this this work that's really meaningful and um, it's personally matters to me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your story and. Uh, I look forward to keeping our conversation going as well. Thanks, Jeffrey. It's really been a, been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode of People Are The Answer. To find out more, go to peoplearetheanswer.com.